Our scripture reading is from James chapter 2. I'll read the verses 2 through 13. I uh, want to point out this morning we dealt with the verses um, 26 and 27 from James chapter 1. Uh, talks there about controlling of the tongue, about showing compassion to those who are in need, and it talks about um, the necessity of purity um, in this world, that we are not to be worldly, we are to be a special chosen people unto the Lord. And these are, are three characteristics of, uh, or you could say tests, for us as Christians, as we live a very, are to live a very unique lifestyle, joyful, even in the face of all difficulty, and because we are chosen by God for his glory in this world. And now in James chapter 2, in James chapter 3, and James chapter 4, he's developing those three points that we talked about this morning. Uh, and he's going to start with actually the second point that talks about our attitude toward others. And it begins with the uh, sin of partiality. And before I begin, I'll also just say, this is an introductory sermon, which is why in the bulletin it says number one afterwards. Um, I actually have two sermons on it, and uh, I wouldn't want you to be here till 11 o'clock tonight or something like that. So we'll read from uh, James chapter 2. My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing and say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit down at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my beloved brothers, has not God chosen those who are poor in the world to be rich in faith and heirs of the kingdom, which he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor man. Are not the rich the ones who oppress you and the ones who drag you into court? Are they not the ones who blaspheme the honorable name by which you are called? If you really fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. For whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. For he who said, do not commit adultery, also said, do not murder. If you do not commit adultery, but do murder, you have become a transgressor of the law. So speak and act as those who are to be judged under the law of liberty. For judgment is without mercy to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Thus far the reading of God's holy word. You may be seated. And we will... Um, Now join together in a time of prayer, asking God to bless us as we hear his word. Father in heaven, we need your help to understand your word as it is preached. Help us to understand it and enable him who preaches to bring it in an understandable way. Give him clarity of thought and expression. Father, it is our desire not to hear him, but to hear you, to learn from you, to learn of you, and how to imitate you in this world. Speak to us, and by your spirit, open our ears, our minds, our hearts, and mold us according to your will. Help us not only to be hearers, but to be doers of your word. Lead us in the way of life everlasting for your glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'll be dealing with the first four verses. Dear people of God, called to be saints, James observed, that's about 2,000 years ago at least, the natural tendency that we have to make judgments 
based on appearances. We're all doing it. Every time we see or meet someone, we all take note of how that person looks. We're making judgments on verbal or visual cues. We make assumptions about people. From clothes, to physical appearance, to stature, to cleanliness, we, we make judgments. And we act on those judgments as well. We tend to make judgments often on surface issues. James, this evening, as I mentioned before, is talking about how we are to live with a genuine religion, true religion. A religion that is patterned after the person and character of Christ, filled with joy in the face of all circumstances. And he's going to show us that this means we are to have a heart of mercy and a heart of compassion to all, just as Christ did. We saw this morning Christ reflected the character of his Father in that. Discrimination based on external matters is, in fact, he would say, a denial of the gospel. He says, my brothers, as believers in our glorious Lord Jesus, don't show favoritism. Literally, what it means is, don't look at someone's face. That is, to be taken in by appearances. That is, therefore, to show favoritism to one, not to another. And it is amazing how much God's word addresses this subject. We all know the story of um, Isaac and Rebekah. They had their favorites. Isaac favored Esau. Rebekah favored Jacob. And we understand how that created some problems. And so we think, well, that's maybe not such a good idea to play favorites with our children. And it is not a very good idea. It's a terrible idea also in the family of God, the church, to make judgments and to play favorites that way. And it is a bad idea in society when we make judgments about people based upon uh, external matters such as size and shape, dress, skin color, and the like. Particularly so as believers, because of who we are. And James shows us why we of all people must not show favoritism. In Leviticus 19, 15, we read, Do not pervert justice, do not show partiality to the poor or favoritism to the rich, but judge your neighbor fairly. God was always concerned that those in society, like the poor, people who have few to no rights, would be treated fairly within the body of believers. Proverbs 28, 21 says, To show partiality is not good, yet a man will do wrong for a piece of bread. Bribery is a form of partiality. You know the expression how one hand can wash the other? A starving man will do almost anything for a piece of bread. Partiality shows up even in church leaders. In Malachi chapter 2, the church leaders are admonished for instructing the people of God wrongly. 
And the Lord says, so I have caused you to be despised and humiliated before all the peoples because you have not followed my ways but have shown partiality in matters of the law. See, even we who are in leadership positions in the church can make judgments based on the superficial, the more external matters, rather than on principles of truth and justice and mercy and love and passion. And the New Testament carries on this um, anti-partiality, anti-favoritism message. The Jews had a hard time accepting the Gentiles. And after receiving a vision from the Lord, Peter says, I, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. Acts 10, 34. And that's echoed in Romans 2, verse 11, where it says that God does not show favoritism. Or in Ephesians 6, 9, there is no favoritism with God. Colossians 3, 25. Anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong, and there is no favoritism with God. And Revelation 22. God shows no favoritism, giving to everyone according to what he has done. And it's kind of amazing when you see that in the Bible, how much that is, is, is condemned. Why, why so strong on this matter of condemnation? It's a sin that we see everywhere. In our day, we see all manner of judgments being made on the basis of nationality, on the basis of skin color, among other things. But that kind of judgment making should not be found here. We have to learn to show here in the body of Christ the mercy and the compassion of Christ. Do you see why we look here in the address, the way he addresses the matter in verse 1? And then the example that is given in verses 2 and 3. And then the conclusion, you'd say, in verse 4. That's not the conclusion of the subject, but that is the conclusion of what we're dealing with this evening. In his opening address in this section, James doesn't just give a command, no favoritism, but he places it in a context. As he started out the book, so now he addresses them again as brothers even though he is the brother of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he is a prominent leader in the New Testament church. What he is going to say is intended to build up. It's not intended to tear down the church. And as he says this, he sees himself on equal footing with them. He's not only a fellow servant, but he is a brother. He's facing the same sort of trials they all are. They are dispersed throughout the world, and they are all together to shine as lights for Christ. And he addresses them as brothers, and he's encouraging them. But notice that he doesn't just say, brothers, show no partiality, but he says, as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. It's an interesting. Another translation says, our glorious Lord Jesus. Why that word, the Lord of glory, or the glorious Lord? Why does he use that particular phrase in this context? And many imply that what James suggests is that, of course, we serve an exalted Lord and Savior who is seated at God's right hand, and no one deserves more honor than he. James is speaking of seats in the illustration to come, and no one should have a seat more prominent than Jesus. So he is obviously the glorious one. 
And who can argue with that? But uh, I think James's thought goes a bit deeper than that. To understand our Lord seated in glory, we must understand how he, the Christ, our mediator, got there. For that, we um, look at Philippians 2, where the church is warned against selfish ambition and against vain conceit. We are told there to, in humility, consider others better than ourselves. Our attitude has to be the same as that of Christ Jesus. And then, what was that attitude? He who deserved the highest place of glory did not hold on to it. He set it aside, and he came as a servant for the sake of our salvation. He did not come into this world in a dazzling display of his glory. But he came as a slave, a servant. And that... of one of the poor people. Consider how he conducted himself on earth. He washed the feet of his disciples to teach them to do likewise. He, who being in the very nature God, did not count equality with God something to be grasped, that is, something to be clung on to at all expense. Refusing to let go. Jesus did not say, sorry, I am not going to set my glory aside. Rather, he set that equality with God aside and made himself of no account. Taking the nature of a servant, humbling himself all the way to death on the cross, He was cast out of the synagogue. He was executed as a criminal, doing it all as our mediator, and is exalted by God that at his name every knee should bow. Creator of the universe humbled himself and became dust in our place, for our sake. No favoritism. And we, believing in him, should not show favoritism or partiality. He didn't show it in his own life, and he wants us to walk in his footsteps. Jesus, who was rich, became poor for our sakes that we might become rich. And in our abundant riches, we must not discriminate against the poor and needy and show favoritism to the rich. It has been a practice in the evangelical church to curry the favor of rich and famous Christians thinking it would be good for the church in evangelism. That would draw other people to us. Jesus' approach was a lot different. He was not afraid to call out those who were rich and famous for their sins. And people noticed and they tried to turn his fairness against him, and he didn't succumb to their temptations. He didn't show favoritism to either rich or poor. And therefore, James introduces this matter of favoritism by referring to the glorious Lord Jesus. Glorious because he emptied himself. That's why he is, has the name that is above all names. We who believe in him know this, and like him, we who have been glorified in him, we must be cleansed 
of this worldly evil of favoritism and partiality and take on the compassion and the mercy that has been shown to us in Christ and show it to others. Mercy triumphs over judgment. James goes on to give an example of such partiality or favoritism. It has to do with people coming into worship. We see someone entering well-dressed and attractive, and we welcome them to our service. But if someone comes in who is clearly poor and not so attractive, perhaps a little repulsive, how welcoming are we? I've been in services where we were in downtown churches, and we would get people walking off the street that you would, truthfully speaking, sometimes grimace. It's not a compliment to myself. How welcoming are we to all who come? Where do we usher those people to sit? How quickly would we have them over to fellowship at our table? In James' example, the poor man is given a seat on the floor. That's the position the slaves took. Today, we don't have those kind of seating arrangements in our churches. But it did happen that the church in the history of our church would purchase prominent pews. If you want an illustration of that, just go to Williamsburg and look at the church there. While the poor would be kept in the balcony or behind a screen someplace. Such snobbery was com not uncommon in the Middle Ages, but as you see, referring to Williamsburg, it's even common within the last several hundred years in our own country. But we do make distinctions even today in the church. There are some churches, it seems like they're primarily for the rich. With a subtle message being given, if you're poor, you should maybe go to the church down the road. Because, you see, we like people to come to church who can pay their way. Not in salvation, of course, but they can at least help out with the budget. We can discriminate on matters, including race, style of dress, political views, and the like. I don't say this to brag, but in our previous congregation I last served, we had somebody come from the community and was told, your type don't belong here. Think about that. What do we do with people who come to church who are not like us and who are clearly, if I might put it that way, living on the street, you'd say, like Lazarus and not like us in our homes? Perhaps some sinners are welcome, but there are some sinners we don't necessarily want to deal with. I, no, I have to be careful, because there are some distinctions that are not wrong to make. For example, it would not be wrong for an usher who met an elderly person at the door, one who perhaps was in a wheelchair or was on crutches, to help them to a place where they could sit, a place prepared for a wheelchair and so on. Whereas if there was a sturdy teenager walking in the door, you wouldn't necessarily have to help them to a seat in the same way. There would be nothing wrong with that kind of distinction. 
It actually is an indication of love. The distinction there does not necessarily come from bias or shallow prejudice. It actually comes from that heart of compassion that Christ has. There is a need that the elderly person may have that the young person doesn't. Now, there could be other concerns that the young person has, and that has to be considered as well. But the response of love in that circumstance is to make that kind of a distinction. The problem that James here is dealing with, and he's talking about partiality, and then he goes on to talk about a gold ring and fine clothing, and then the poor man, those are judgments based on external matters. We might judge a well-dressed person better while be a bit more suspicious of a poorly dressed person thinking he might be here to milk the system and to get help. We tend to judge the one as having better motives than the other or perhaps, perhaps even being spiritually better and therefore more blessed than the other. And I wonder what we would have thought of Jesus and his disciples. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? And that band of disciples? Those Galileans? Look at who he hangs out with. Publicans. Prostitutes, sick, poor, even associates with the Gentiles. Church leaders of his day were very glad to get Jesus out of the way. How often are we not judges with evil thoughts, as James indicates in verse 4? And that is the issue. What are we thinking in our hearts? Are we thinking with the mind of Christ? Perhaps James here, as he's talking, has in mind the attitude of Israel when they first saw King Saul. They were so impressed with this tall and handsome man. But of course, Saul's heart was not as it should be. And then you remember when Samuel was sent to anoint a successor to King Saul. When he saw Eliab, son of Jesse, he thought, ah, this is surely the next guy. And God said, 1 Samuel 16, 7, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look on the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. In the kingdom of God, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. The youngest was chosen. As you remember from the last part of the section that we read that we're not going to deal with, the whole way that God works out his plan of salvation is not based on externals. It is by salvation... It is salvation by faith alone, by grace alone. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Anyone, and I have that underlined in my notes, anyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. This should not um, result in a reverse bias against the rich. Because that definitely would defeat the whole purpose, wouldn't it? That would deny the whole matter of salvation by faith and grace. We do not look at the externals. Beautiful homes are often sad homes. Beautiful clothes and makeup can cover sad hearts. I have worshipped with believers 
in the mountains of Haiti in a tent, in a church in Kenya, and in churches, one just being a lean-to in Uganda, many of these people living in huts. Many of them, few possessions, possessions and little food. But they were brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ. We look, we are to look at each other as God sees us in Christ from a heavenly point of view. We cannot see the hearts of people. But that doesn't mean we judge, therefore, on external matters. We have to use righteous judgment. And when we meet others who come to worship or we go out to bring others into the fellowship of Christ, anyone who believes is saved. All are welcome. Do we mean that? All are welcome. Mind you of Jesus' words in Matthew 25. Whatever we do unto the least of these, my brothers, we do it unto him. The nature of the kingdom of Christ is so different than the kingdoms of this world, than, than the standards of the United States of America. In the kingdom of God, the least shall be the greatest, the last first. And he who would be great must be servant of all. And so we must be careful at how we look at others. There's so much more that has to be said on this yet, but before we leave it, consider what it would be like if you were the poor man in Jesus' illustration and we're told, sit here at my feet. What kind of a message do you think he got? The poor man is being given a message that he doesn't belong, that he isn't really wanted. At least he's not on the same par as others in the church. He's not dressed right. Maybe he has the wrong skin color. Maybe he lives in the wrong place of town or, or something. He may not even know why he's been told, you sit there in the position of the slave. And what if that person was, in fact, a believer? Or perhaps was one that God led there to be led to the faith. What are we doing by those kind of distinctions but creating division and distinctions in the body of Christ? And that ought not be. James says, have you not made, verse 4, distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? There, James goes right to the heart of the issue. When we show favorites, we are saying to some people, you're my type. And to others, you're not really my type. When we show favoritism, we make distinctions that God does not make. And the problem is our heart is full of evil motives and evil thoughts. What we say is, I'm good enough to be here. Something is not wrong with me that is wrong with you. And therefore, I have the right, the ability, even the duty to have you sit over there 
maybe even to exclude you. That was expressed in the first century by where you stood or where you sat. And the reality is, none of us deserves to be here. We are here only because of the humbling service of our Savior and the gift of faith by the Spirit. Our only comfort is that we belong to Jesus Christ, body and soul. Don't you wish that every person, every person would enjoy this comfort? And we must show that in our actions toward others. We must show that mercy, that compassion, or we deny the very basic premise of our faith. Religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit the orphans and the widows, to take care of those who are the outcasts of society. It's not a subject we're finished with yet. But remember that Christ came to save the poor and the needy like us. And let us, overwhelmed with his love, be filled with his love. Overwhelmed with his mercy, be filled with mercy. And learn to love as he is loved. And to show mercy as he has shown mercy. For all, regardless of circumstance. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Your word through James often cuts to our heart and it reminds us that we are far from being perfect as you desire us to be. Forgive us. And we thank you for the righteousness of Christ. We thank you for his atoning sacrifice on our behalf. Forgive us, and by your spirit, continue to work in us, change us, mold us, and shape us, that we may live in this world according to the standards of your kingdom, and not simply according to the impulses of our sinful nature. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.